Good day and welcome to CIM's virtual event brought to you by the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Today we'll be talking about operationalizing diversity and inclusion through risk management. I'm Mary Lou Raboulis, Client Relations at CIM. Thank you for joining us. Some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. If you dialed in with a traditional phone, ensure the phone button is selected. During the presentation, you will be asked to participate in some polls. Please type or select the multiple choice answers in your poll box in the control panel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box in the control panel. The questions will be addressed at the end of the and now, without further ado, I'd like to present the moderator of this session, Simone Henscher. Simone is a member of CIM's Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee and is manager Mine Technical Services for Rio Tinto based in California. So actively involved in the Inclusion Council at her mine site and is passionate about ensuring we can bring our best selves to work. Welcome, Simone. Thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, we're pleased to have you join us this afternoon and evening. Um, pleased to let you know also that this webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the diversity and inclusion section of the CIM website. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, participate, participants this evening from Peru, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Manitoba, Quebec, Utah and New Hampshire. Uh, as per usual, I would like to start us off with a poll, and um, Mary Lou or Elaine is going to put our poll up. What is your knowledge on operationalizing diversity and inclusion through risk management? Go ahead, Mary Lou. I've launched it. Elaine, I don't know if you can move the slide because we're still at the question one. There we go. Thank you all for participating in the poll. Um, now I would introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Michael. Michael is the founder and CEO of Mindtel, a risk and performance data company. Mindtel offers an enterprise risk management SAAS platform to help measure risk exposure and control effectiveness in real time. Michael has nearly 20 years of global risk management experience in oil and gas, Royal Dutch Shell and mining with Barrett Gold. Mindtel has been supporting companies across multiple sectors to take a data-driven approach to COVID-19 risk management. Welcome, Michael. Thanks very much, Simone. Uh, delighted to be here. And thank you to the organizers and to everyone who's taken time out of your busy schedule uh, to, uh, to be with us. I'm going to show my screen here. And do let us know that you can uh, see the first slide, please. Yeah, we see it, Michael. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, it's a delight to be here and be able to speak with, with uh, a, a, a new uh, a, a new network of people that I've not been exposed to yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to to share my perspective on how diversity and inclusiveness can be operationalized through risk management. Um, basically, housekeeping from my side as well. Uh, I promise uh, one thing, and I, I would ask one thing in return. I promise not to uh, bore you with slide after slide of uh, text heavy uh, uh, bullet points. Uh, but uh, in return, I would ask that if you please have a question, if you have a question, uh, please let Simone know, uh, and we can ask it throughout the presentation. I don't mind uh, stopping. 
I think part of the, the, the learning for me is, is hearing the questions that people have, uh, what is resonating, what doesn't make sense. So by all means, I'd rather see this as a, uh, as a discussion, as an interactive discussion, rather than kind of me speaking to you for, for, for 45 minutes or so. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll get started. Uh, and as Simone mentioned, I, I started my career uh, with, uh, with Royal Dutch Shell uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and early in my career, our, our company had a, uh, you know, had a huge catastrophe from a financial reporting standpoint. And there was a big shakeup at the top. And a man called uh, Jeroen van de Veer uh, took over Shell CEO uh, in, in 2004. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. This is a, a talk on diversity and inclusion. And I'm already evoking the wisdom of an old white guy. Um, but uh, what your room taught me has stuck with me. And it was about diversity and, and what he called diversity inclusiveness and diversity inclusion. And his first communique to uh, all Shell staff set out his five priorities. Uh, first was safety, but second was diversity inclusiveness. And every single talk that he gave regardless whether it was to investors, uh, to uh, people in the corporate staff, uh, to uh, the oil refineries in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, West Africa and elsewhere, he always went through his priority list and diversity inclusiveness was the, se was the second behind safety. And what he, what he taught me about this, that this is more focused on process and not about targets. He was very, he came from the oil products uh, side, of the, uh, side of the business. And so he was very process focused. And this was his take on diversity inclusiveness, diversity inclusion. And, and this is what I learned from him. And this is how I see integrating uh, diversity inclusion uh, through risk management. So my, my, my actually my predecessor uh, at Shell, uh, Mindy Howard, did a lot of work um, after she left the role that I took over for. Uh, in this particular space, and uh, this was uh, 20 years ago. So I, I was experienced, uh, sorry, exposed to some uh, some pioneers uh, in this uh, in this space. So what is diversity in risk management? And uh, when I was pulling these slides together here the last uh, week or so, uh, this is a question that my wife asked me. So well, what does this what, what does diversity mean? What does inclusion mean? And it got me thinking that I didn't really have a solid answer for that straight off the bat. So I, I gave us some thought. And so for me, diversity when it comes to risk management is that you have a critical mass of inputs. And when I say inputs, these are, are viewpoints or data points or data sources to do three things. You can define the goal and the activities that you need to do. You can test the effectiveness of those things that you're doing. And lastly, uh, you can assess uh, whether you've achieved your objectives or not. And, and really, this is what drives risk management, identifying what we need to do, identifying where some of the threats are to be able to, to achieve our objectives, and then assessing whether those objectives uh, have been met. So when I think about diversity and risk management, this is what I think about. So from an inclusion standpoint, uh, you know, and, and again, I'm going back to the, the words of uh, Mr. Von der uh, this is about process, right? So this is not about taking a box. This is not about taking attendance, right? And, and I see four key elements of inclusion when it comes to risk management and conveniently, they uh, all start with the letter I. Are people involved? Yeah. And we've all been in those meetings where you feel uh, benched to, to use a, for lack of a better term, where, where you're not involved in the discussion. So that involvement has to be there. It's one thing to have a, a great diverse organization uh, who can inform you on your risk management processes, but if you're not involving them, then you're, you're, you're leaving money on the table. The second is that this involvement has to be interactive, that this is not a one-way conversation. Thirdly, that inclusion's got to be informative. You've got to be talking about things that are relevant to achieving your objectives. Right, so that this is a, is a high value information, high value conversations that are being uh, driven in an inclusive way. Uh, and lastly, this has to be iterative. This, this has to repeat on a regular basis. 
So one of the things I've, I've seen in the mining sector, when they go and do an engagement, I know this has changed over the years, is that we you know, put on a big uh, effort to do one engagement session, but that's not good enough. We, we need to have this uh, be, be very iterative. So when I think of uh, inclusion in risk management, these are the four elements of inclusion that reside with me. So our approach to risk management is, is quite simple. We see that most companies, if not all, need to treat risk management as a change management project. Uh, identifying where they need to be as an organization when it comes to, to risk and identifying where they're starting from and then being able to define where the gaps are. But once we've done that, we follow three basic steps. And what I'd like to do is to explore each of these steps in a little more detail through the lens of diversity and inclusion. So first is context. And anyone who's picked up uh, ISO 31000 um, or um, COSO or any of the uh, high level frameworks uh, on or standards on risk management, all of them will say that context is of, of the utmost importance. Context is key. You have to understand the context in which you're making decisions in which you're operating it. And uh, this is extremely important uh, through the risk management process. And I want to touch on why it's so critical that diversity inclusion is part of that context mapping uh, exercise. So what we want to do is we really want to map the boundaries for the scope. And I, I imagine that many of you would have been involved in uh, risk assessments at some point or in some uh, some form or another uh, over the uh, uh, over the span of your respective careers. And if we are, are allotted uh, an amount of time, for me, I would spend half the time on defining the scope because that helps you define the context. I'd spend about 1% uh, uh, doing the, the, the classic uh, assessment because that is, is typically straightforward. I'd spend 20% identifying the controls and the other 30% figuring out how we're gonna monitor those controls. Uh, but for me, when we're mapping the boundaries for the scope of, the, of, of whatever risk that we're managing, there's really two things that we wanna look at. What's the level of complexity in the environment? And what's the level of uncertainty? And so I wanna to touch on the, the complexity of the environment first. And really this is three basic components. What is the business environment that we're operating in? What's the, what's the operating environment? Uh, and what's also the decision-making environment? And again, the scope of your risk, uh, of, of the risk that you're trying to manage is going to inform which of these or a combination or all of them that you need to consider uh, as part of uh, as, as part of your, your pardon me your, your risk management um, process I'm sorry I may have uh, ended this there we go Excuse yeah me. you're good it's back there you're good okay it's great okay great uh, I was trying to get the um, little uh, panel of the way so, so that's the, the, the environment. The, the second piece is around uncertainty. And uh, ISO defines risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And it's a very nice, tidy uh, definition for risk, something that is uh, not very well understood in terms, of, uh, in terms of a definition. But what we want to map out here is how is this context changing uh, over time. And this is where we need to look at uh, horizons, short-term, medium-term, long-term. And again, those are going to be dependent upon uh, the, you know, the, the context that you're looking at, uh, the, the scope of work that you're dealing with. Short-term may be two months, it may be two years. Long-term may be six months, it may be six decades. Uh, and, and so again, these are things for the team to, uh, to define, right? And Really, what you what you're what you're mapping out is we're saying okay for a business environment, uh, you know we see the uncertainty increasing as well as the complexity in the short term, um, more complexity uh, in the in the medium term, but in the long term we expect that that 
complexity to draw back as well as a little bit of uncertainty. And we do that again for the, for the operating environment as well as the decision-making environment. And this really helps us put a, some boundaries around that scope, which then allow us to go on and have a much more focused uh, risk management process going forward. I'll, I'll go back to, to Shell, and, and one of the things that they pioneered back in the 70s and 80s uh, was something called scenario planning. And perhaps many of you have uh, you know, have heard of that or have been involved in scenario planning uh, within your respective organizations. Uh, but this was an exercise that was fascinating to me early in my career because what I was expecting was that there'd be a bunch of uh, you know petrochemical engineers, uh, you know geophysicists uh, all in a room together mapping out the risk for this energy company. But I was astounded when looking at the the reports, there were you know anthropologists, uh, there were economists who were involved. There were sociologists, right? They were looking at the migration of people, how energy was going to be consumed in developing countries in 30, 50 years time. Uh, it really spoke to, um, again, you move on to Veer's vision of, uh, of building in diversity and inclusion as part of the process. And, and really, this is what I expect um, a, a lot of organizations to be doing now. They may not call it scenario planning, uh, but certainly, this is a start of any scenario planning exercise uh, for risk assessments and risk management in, in, in many organizations. Now, I want to contrast that to an organization that I got exposed to about 10 years ago. And they had informed me that they, uh, that they had carried out uh, a, a scenario planning exercise. I thought, okay, this is, you know, this is great. I was delighted to, to, delighted to hear that. And then they went on to present their, their findings from this. And frankly, the findings I thought were a little bit, um, how should we say, uh, limited uh, in, their, in their scope, uh, in their horizon, uh, but also what they were touching on in terms of the business operating and decision-making environments. And then it emerged that there were five people who were involved in this scenario planning exercise, all of whom worked for the environmental function. And I thought to myself, wow, we've really missed an opportunity to include uh, a, a diverse set of viewpoints, a diverse set of data points uh, into, this, uh, in, into this necessary discussion and this necessary exercise. So again, this Michael, is how can I, I see- the, you Can may, I interrupt please. you there? We do have a question. Um, the question is, um, can you just explain a bit more how you're defining decision-making environment? Yeah, great question. So, um, so this is about what information is available to us, um, and and again, that may be seem fairly high level, but again, this is going to be uh, relevant to the scope, relevant to the context of the risks that you're that you're managing. Uh, so, for example, if we're looking at um, you know the environmental impact of process X, right? Uh, well, our decision making environment is that going to be more uncertain? Uh, because of, um, or so it would be less uncertain because of the data that we're able to to pull in. Is it be kind of come uh, more complex because of uh, additional regulations that uh, that may come in in the the short term or medium term? Um, uh, as, again, as it relates to this particular process and the effect that that's going to have on on the environment. Now that decision making process, we can scale this up or down. Uh, the decision-making making process may be, um, or decision-making environment, pardon me, may be for a, a team within an organization, right? So what information do they need to be able to decide whether they're going in the right direction, whether they need to allocate more capital and resources in certain areas and take them away from, uh, from certain other areas? Um, so please, I, I would ask you to reach back to the individual who asked that question. First of all, thank you for asking that question, uh, and, and and test whether that uh, uh, response uh, satisfies the question. Thank you. Um, yeah, Andrew, if you're good with that, could you just reply back in the comment section that that's helpful? Yes, good. Thank you, Michael. Okay, great. Thanks for the question. Sorry, was it Andrew? Yes, 
Andrew. Okay, thanks, Andrew. All right, so that's context. Now we get into the next step around uh, capability, right? And this is really important because we now we know our scope, we know our boundaries, and now we've got to you know, bring the right skills together to know what to measure and know when to act, yeah? And, and unfortunately, a lot of organizations, and, I'll, and I'm gonna pick on mining here, uh, they say, well, here's a bunch of things that we can measure, so therefore, they're all important, right? And what we get is this, you know, massive geyser of data and noise that we're trying to operate in and trying to make decisions from, uh, and it's, it's frankly, it's overwhelming, right? Where I challenge us is to say, okay, well, do we have the right skills in place to be able to determine, first of all, what's important, yeah? That's going to help us to, to know what to measure. And then we can define those thresholds. So the information that we are uh, receiving from the, from the operating environment uh, is coming to us at a rate where we can start to make better decisions, right? Because this is about making better decisions uh, with, with regards to risk management. And really the goal of any risk management system is that you are making risk-informed or risk-based uh, decisions. So again, from a diversity and inclusion standpoint, you know, one person or one or two people can't possibly know all of the things that you need to measure and, and when to act. This is where we need to make sure that we're bringing in the right capabilities, the right skills. They may be internal, they may be external, they may be up or down within your organization and bringing those people together to be able to, to know what to measure and, and know when to act. So that's kind of setting things up. And then as we're, as we're working, uh, I want to introduce this, this, um, this notion of work is imagined versus work is done. And those of you who have uh, perhaps a human factors background or uh, a human operator, an organizational performance background, you will have heard this term. Right? And the theory is that you know, we, we know what to measure, we know when to act, and then we say, okay, well, this is how the work is going to be carried out. Right? But as we all know, regardless of whether we're in an operating environment, project environment, corporate or site environment, yeah, the work is done actually drifts from how that work it, we, we initially imagined it to be. Right? And whilst we're working and drifting away, what we're experiencing are a series of you know, hidden hazards, threats, system weaknesses. Yet yeah, systems inherently drift toward failure. And, and so therefore, if we're not uh, actively seeking out ways to improve them, we're going to have this, th this accumulation of, of hazards, threats, and weaknesses, where when that drift meets accumulation, we're, we're going to have a, a catastrophic event. And I'm sure that many of you have, you know, can, can relate a story from your professional past to where the drift was uh, was taking place, uh, where that accumulation was taking place, and then we had that, um, you know, we had that ma uh, that major event. Uh, a, a reference that I want to share here is a, a phenomenon called the, the normalization of deviance. Again, some of you may have heard of this. Uh, uh, and, and this is a um, this is from a woman uh, Diane Vaughn. She was a professor at Columbia. Um, uh, pardon me. She was a professor uh, of sociology uh, when the Columbia disaster, uh, the Challenger disaster, hit in 1986. And then again, uh, she wrote about this normalization of deviance, where problems uh, initially are unexpected, but nothing bad happens. So then they become part of the normal way of working. So those problems go from being unexpected to uh, expected. Uh, and again, still nothing happens. And then what happens is those problems become accepted. So we just say, well, well, this is just part of now the operating environment that we're, that we're working in. And this is an example of accumulation uh, or, or drift. Um, so again, I would, I would urge you to read up on, on Dr. Vaughn's work because uh, she has been a pioneer uh, in, in this particular field. So capacity and again, leveraging diversity and inclusion. For me, there, a, a, an organization needs to demonstrate the capacity to do five things with regards, to, uh, with regards to risk management. We need to be able to have the capacity to detect, 
where we have those system weaknesses, those hazards, threats, et cetera. We need to be able to, to listen, you know, listen to our frontline operations, listen to people who are involved in that process to be able to, 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 to define that drift. Uh, thirdly, is the, the capacity to intervene. Right. And um, you'll have to excuse me if you hear my daughter uh, at bath time. So I do apologize. Uh, but it is 630. Um, it's this capacity to intervene. Right. And, and what what does that look like? What are we intervening on? Uh, are these things important? Uh, how are we measuring how effective those interventions are? Right. And then this capacity to inform. So how do we communicate with the internal stakeholders that we have, but also external stakeholders about how we're managing risks. And then lastly, uh, is this capacity to improve both the environment in which we're operating in, but also the processes uh, that, we, that we execute in those environments. So these are kind of the five things that I want, I, I like look for in organizations uh, with regards to the capacity of their risk management systems. And if we set the context correct, if we have the capabilities to know what to measure, know when to act, be able to um, really test the effectiveness of those things that we're doing, then that enables us to do these five things uh, very, very well. And the, the companies that succeed versus the companies that don't, the companies that succeed, they do these things uh, very, very well. And they're, they're, they're not only passionate about it, they're, they're obsessive about it. Um, but for, for us, where I see diversity and inclusion has the, the greatest influence is in the, is in the following areas. But first, that capacity to listen. How are we setting up systems that are, are low friction, yet that are, are collective, uh, and that provide that line of sight uh, for decision makers? You know, the question that often challenges organizations that I work with is, how do your systems help you see what the front line sees? Yeah. And I haven't really got you know great answers to that, to be fair. Uh, but this is really the challenge of the systems that we put in place and our, our risk management systems, again, defining the activities, testing the effectiveness, assessing whether we've achieved our objectives. Right. So again, that, that capacity to listen is um is, is absolutely critical. Uh, another reference I'll give uh, on, on this is a book called Meltdown, uh, Why Our Systems Fail and What we Can We Do About It. It's actually written by uh, a professor and a, co and a colleague of his uh, from the University of Toronto. Uh, it's a very easy read, it's a great read, but uh, they, they really focus on, uh, on that capacity to listen within an organization. Yep, the second is capacity to intervene. But we wanna be intervening so we can proactively predict and prevent versus this kind of vicious cycle of uh, react, repair, repeat. You know, I don't see interventions uh, being on the back of a major event. You know, that, that there's, it's too late for that. So let's go back to that question that I asked around the, the, the capability. Know what to measure and know when to act. That's really where, you know, I, I could rephrase that question is know what to measure, know when to intervene. Uh, and, and we should be intervening on things that aren't uh, you know, abject failures, but we should be able to detect uh, you know, where, where that drift is taking place, where those, that accumulation is starting to build up uh, to, to a critical mass. That's when we want to be able to intervene and, and do, so, uh, do so systematically uh, and not just leave it by, uh, leave it by chance, which, which it is now in, in, in many organizations. And, and lastly, the capacity to inform. You know, we want data to drive our engagement with, uh, with internal and external stakeholders. Storytelling is so important when it comes to being able to connect, particularly with e external stakeholders. Uh, and if we don't have the data, then the storytelling is, is fluff, right? And because we want to be able to, you know, to deliver that insight to help uh, data inform decisions, um, you know, within projects, within our within our organizations, within our operations, but also provide you know the the external stakeholders the information they need to help them understand our story, to, for them to be better engaged uh, with our organization. And the typical five levels that that I look at is we have our, our host government, we've got our investors, we've got our um, 
uh, pardon me, our uh, regulators or insurers, uh, and then we've got our our community members as well. And these are all uh, people that we want to be able to engage with, and if we can do so in a data-driven way, that uh, aids in our storytelling. It helps to broaden the insight that we can that we can deliver. So that is basically the the what I wanted to kind of talk through. Uh, I promised that there wouldn't be a lot of slides with a lot of dense text, and I hope I honored that. Uh, thank you for asking uh, uh, at least the, the, the one question. I hope to to answer many more uh, after this is done. But so Mindtel, we operate at the nexus of risk management, data science, and human factors. Uh, we feel that all of these th things uh, are, are necessary to to complete a, a, a proper risk management framework uh, within any organization in mining and in elsewhere. And so for me, the kind of the leave behind message, and, and this is where, again, diversity and inclusion is absolutely critical. Um, and again, I'll go back to the previous slide. We don't have that, you know, the, the chances that we're going to be able to engage better, that we're going to be able to storytell better, that we're going to be able to provide uh, greater insight is, is severely impaired if we don't have that, uh, the, the necessary diversity and inclusion. So, so for me, the output is that you drive better transparency. I mean, think about the situation that we're in right now with uh, with COVID-19. Right? The psychological contract of healthy people entering a healthy workspace, it's off the table, right? And, and in order for organizations to reopen and remain open safely, we need that transparency. We, we need to see the, the, the data that we've got healthy people entering a healthy workspace because the, the outcome of that is we've got greater assurance, you know, reasonable assurance, never absolute assurance, but reasonable assurance that the systems, the controls that we put in place are working as intended by design. And, and then lastly, the effect is we become a much more resilient organization. And, and really, this is what the, the investment community is now looking for from a climate perspective, from an ESG perspective, whatever, whatever that may be from an operational perspective. And, and driving a, a data-driven approach, leveraging diversity and inclusion through your risk management process Will allow you to do these three things. So with that, I'll say thank you very much again for the opportunity to, to share our perspective on, uh, on on this topic. And again, happy to answer any questions that uh, that anyone may have. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was actually very informative. And um, you know, when we um, first of all, I got to say that was the first time I've heard of normalization of deviation. We usually call it risk normalization, but um, that's really interesting. And I'm uh, really looking forward to doing some more research on that. But, um, you know, when it comes to risk management, um, when we're not involving the right people, um, we're missing so many pieces of the puzzle. And and I really appreciate the um, the commentary around not just involving them, but doing it in in such a way that you're actually getting the information so making the environment um conducive to um having everyone participate so that was very good thank you so um i'll put it out to questions um please type your questions into the uh question box So I've got one for you, Michael. Um, curious uh, if you have any data, or even you know anecdotally, if you can explain what um, you know sort of the gravity of uh, not involving the right people and not being inclusive uh, when we're engaging in things like risk assessments. Um, yeah. So so yeah. What, what what's the What's the drawback of of leaving people on the bench or or leaving people uh, leaving people out of the loop? Um, well, I mean, I'll, let me go back to the challenger and um, and Columbia disasters. Right? Uh, you know, people that were that had the information around the O rings, around the heat shields, um, they were not systematically involved in the critical decisions about uh, not just go no go, right? But uh, about what led up to each of those events, you know, the O-ring just didn't fail once. The heat shield just didn't fail once. This information was uh, was known, uh, but was not systematically sought out uh, by um, you know by the by NASA, which at the time obviously 
and, and I know things have changed, you know, they're very, you know, schedule driven, you know, the, the launch must go on. And, and that suppressed a lot of, of, of information, not again, not just at the point of the, the catastrophes, but leading up to, uh, leading up to each of those where they knew both O-rings and heat shields were a problem, but they didn't explore that enough. So the problem went from being unexpected to expected to accepted. Thank you, Michael. Okay, um, another question here. With safety, oh, we have safety checklists. What can we use daily for diversity and inclusion type behavior? Well, I think that's a, I think that's a good question. And yeah, and, and be wary of the checklist first and foremost. Uh, it, it, it can uh, it, it can lull an organization into um, a, a you know a, a false sense of security. But what you need to be doing is asking yourselves not not what needs to be on that checklist, but what do those items relate to, right? So going back to knowing what to measure, knowing when to act, right? Uh, what are we actually testing? So I talked about uh, at the beginning, you know, the purpose of diversity in, in risk management is to be able you know, to test the effectiveness in a systematic way. So what I would be looking for from a diversity and inclusion standpoint is those things that are really important to us, typically our, our critical controls, if we're going to talk from a, from a safety standpoint, is I need to know what I need to measure to answer the question, how effective is that control right now? And then I need to be able to go out and systematically harvest that information from people, machines, and equipment. And I don't want to be relying on a single datum point to be able to make the decision that the, that the controls are in place or not, right? So this is less about what's on the checklist rather than uh, are we sufficiently engaging the right people to be able to inform whether that control is indeed effective because the, there's an inverse relationship between control effectiveness uh, and, and risk exposure. Thank you. And I actually have um, another um, related question. Um, actually, there's a couple of good ones here, so let me just see what, what order makes the most sense. Um, I'll go with this one. Is there a structured process for identification slash selection of risk review team? And um, how might you link that to a particular risk? Uh, so is there a process to, to select the team? Um, again, I would go back to uh, making sure that you've got error on the side of more functions rather than fewer functions involved in your in your context mapping, right? You get more people involved in mapping the boundaries and defining the scope, and then that will uh, that will let you know who needs to be involved in again defining what uh, the goals and what activities you're going to be doing. Uh, who's going to be involved in testing the effectiveness and who's going to be involved in assessing whether those objectives uh, have been achieved or not. So that's where I would focus my, my energy. Uh, initially, I said 50% around uh, you know, defining the scope. Uh, I would have more rather than less in, that, um, in, the, in those discussions. And then that group will be able to, de to determine what the optimal representation would look like uh, downstream from that. Perfect. Thank you. Now, now this one um, is actually quite interesting to me um, because it's uh, it's almost a, a little bit of a circular question, but um, I, I think it's a valid question. So, um, are you aware of any risk assessments that one can do to look for risks in a system that's supposed to foster diversity and inclusion? Okay, I'm going to ask you to ask that question again, please, politely. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Are you aware of any risk assessments that one can do to check for risks in a system that's supposed to foster diversity and inclusion? Uh, so offhand, uh, no. Um, however, what I would want to be testing uh, as part of like leading indicators of my risk management uh, process 
is what's the level of engagement that we have on those things that are most important to us. Right. Second would be, uh, you know, what what uh, are, are we taking the right actions? So are we taking the actions in a timely manner? Are we working on those things that are are the you know of the most of the highest priority? Or are we just kind of working on easy things? And then lastly, I would ask, well, how effective are those actions? Right. And, and so what that drives is we have. Uh, you know, assurance that we're getting the diversity in identifying where these issues are. We've got the inclusion piece on defining uh, fit for purpose solutions to those uh, to those particular problems. So detecting where we have that accumulation and finding ways to to keep the drift away from the accumulation to kind of keep that uh, margin of error as as large as possible. Um, and then, and then thirdly, we've got a, a kind of a, a team that uh, can can easily assess whether the uh, the intervention that was made had its desired effect, uh, and and that's really important because there's great learning um, in identifying if something that we've done to fix problem X worked or not. And there's no shame in in, in being able to say, well, no, it, it it didn't work. I mean, think about all the kind of remedial actions that come out of uh, audits or you know this kind of management review etc um you know insurance reviews you know what do you what, what's measured right now what's measured is you know you've got this list of 127 things did you close the note in three months or yes or no and, well how good is that right what, what does that tell you that just you know demonstrates you've got the capacity to administer not the capability to manage your risks so I, I would again uh, look at uh, are, are people engaged in the right thing? So what's the volume of engagement and the diversity of engagement? Are we including the right people in solving the problems? And then how effective are those solutions? Because that will tell you whether A, you're defining the problems correctly and B, whether you solve them uh, appropriately. Thank you. That's, uh, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, I don't have any other questions coming through, so I would um, give one more shout out to, oh, I, I have another one, <laughs> just as I'm saying Great. that. Um, have you seen diversity and inclusion KPIs used in risk assessment? Uh, yeah, KPIs, that's a, it's a bit of a landmine, that. Uh, so the short answer is no. Uh, and, and again, I'll go back to what uh, Ruvon von Devere said around, this is not about targets, it's about process. Right, and and a lot of people uh, skew the definition uh, of of a KPI. But what, what does the P stand for in in KPI? It stands for performance, right? Uh, whereas a lot of people use KPIs as the results, right? But the results are a product of the performance that we execute in order to achieve those results, and that performance tells us whether those results are safe, repeatable, sustainable. Yeah. So yeah, the 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 targets for uh, you know board representation, et cetera, these are these are the right things to do. Um, you know, in, inherently we we think we think that it, it certainly you know there, there there's data that supports that. Um, but that is not where we should stop because that's really easy to to, to tick and say, okay, now we've got our diversity and inclusion sorted out. Um, I would then go in and, and really drive that KPI discussion, say, okay, well, are we actually using data uh, or, or these indicators that help us measure performance? And I'll go back to those three things that I talked about before, engagement, action, effectiveness, right? Those would be fabulous, fabulous indicators uh, that would that would tell you whether your your diversity inclusion is, is a functioning um you know it, it is functional pardon me uh, within your organization or whether you know or, or whether it's just um uh you know whether it's just talking points fantastic point um okay i've got another one here are you seeing lots of inclusion in teams you work with as mine tell um has this changed over the years um ethnic women otherwise what's your view of 
what is your view of problem solving you're seeing? So um, yeah, really just in your view, what are you seeing and, and are, you, are you seeing a change? Uh, I, I, I am um, slowly. Um, and the way that we're we're helping organizations um, you know manage risk better being a risk performance data company is that we are democratizing uh, the assessment of controls. So we're not leaving that to an auditor. We're not leaving that to a senior manager because that's a single data point, right? What we're trying to do is is bring those observations, bring that those assessments. Uh, down to the floor level and, and across the organization to be able to knit all that information, all those data together, analyze them and say, okay, now we're making decisions off of bell curves rather than data points. Uh, and and so from, from our standpoint, this is how we're helping to literally operationalize it uh, uh, in, in the field. Um, but again, I would go back to, um, you know, I think where the question is 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 targeted is more around that boundary mapping, context mapping uh, activities, uh, and and this is where when we're helping define the scope for organizations, we get as many people as we can uh, involved, uh, and and really try and hit multiple levels uh, of, of the organization because nine times out of ten the management are very very silent. And and their subordinates are are the ones who are who are driving the uh, the, the scope definition. Uh, so that that we set up that environment to be very inclusive. Um, you know, we have limited um, uh, uh, capacity to to influence the diversity within organizations that we work with. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the the old saying, diversity is uh, you know getting an invitation and inclusion is being being asked to dance, right? So we can we can certainly support that last bit if uh, if the organizations that we work with meet us halfway in the diversity piece. Super, thank you. Um, here's a very interesting one. Can we assign risk to stuff like signage that's not inclusive or non-inclusive um, using non-inclusive language like man or men at work, etc.? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's something that um, you. Yeah. In terms of taking down the wallpaper uh, of of lack of inclusion, for for lack of a better term, um, you know that that that's that that's an easy one, um, and, and frankly, that's a that, that that's a that's a no brainer, um, and yeah, and and I, and I see this this challenge in, in you know in a lot of the language we use, and, I, and I'm I'm guilty of it. Uh, you know, I'm a white guy in my 40s, right? Uh, I I'm, I'm probably guilty of of uh, not at least putting up the wallpaper, but ignoring it because it looks so familiar to me. Um, but but again, this is where uh, you know we get cold eye reviews on, on things, which which don't make sense. And you know, let me give an example. I I, I came from oil and gas, um, you know, very regimented. You know, I would go offshore in the North Sea, Caspian Sea, and the first thing I'd be told by the GM is to, is you know. Congratulations, welcome aboard. We work on a bomb. Don't do me any favors, right? If you see something that's not on, you know, you 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 let us know, right? And and so even, you know, coming into coming into mining, things that didn't make any sense. The 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 day that I walked into uh, an organization I worked with in the past, and we were adjacent to the the HR team, and I saw this this advert, you know, it was a poster trying to 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 drum up recruitment. And the the HR group, which were predominantly women, it must be said, they said, "Well, you know, what do you think? We're going to roll this out in you know in Northern Ontario and about where, where where we had uh, where we had sites." And I said, "Well, first of all, these are all men. Right? There, there there's there there are no female representation on this." And at, frankly, I was I was astounded that I was the one having to tell this this team of women that. Um, and, and, and so it's it, it's 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 hard to break down that that wallpaper uh, is I guess is my is my point here. But I think getting cold eyes like I had on a new industry um, and and making sure that I'm aware of what that looks like, then we can start to you know to tear that down um, 
in a much more efficient fashion. Superb, thank you. Um, and I'd also like to remind everybody that uh, if you go in with the right attention, you can even use your own eyes as cold eyes. Um, you know, if you go out with that in mind, um, you, you can do that. Okay, um, I don't have any more questions coming through. Um, I did, I was meant to launch the um, second poll um, prior to the Q&A and I forgot to do that. So I would um, just ask Mary Lou if she can launch that poll now. Okay, what was so your the question? The data going to be skewed because of the Q&A now, so on you. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, sorry, Mary Lou, I was just going to see if you could launch the um, second poll. Yes. I forgot to launch it. Thank you. It's launched. I don't know when it goes onto the screen. Elaine, if you uh, stop sharing your screen, what happens? There we go. Okay, super, thank you. Uh, so just one more note before we close it out. Um, first of all, thank you, Michael, so much for, for sharing your time with us this evening. Uh, it was very informative. And um, if anyone has any lingering questions, uh, as per usual, you can send them through and we'll, we'll um, send them along to Michael. Um, our next webinar is scheduled March 25th and the topic is the link between inclusion and diversity and high performance operations. And that will be presented by Jamil Cruz. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a good night.